firstly, I guess before we dive into the technology, um, tell us a little bit about um, yourself. Where did you, I, you're, you have an American accent, you grew up somewhere in the States. What's going on? How did you end up at Palantir in the UK? Yeah, you're very perceptive. Uh, <laughs> I am from a town called Boring, Oregon. Uh, it's on the West Coast. It's actually called Boring. Um, yeah. We have more, we have more <laughs> people you, here from Boring? You. All right. Yeah, it's a big crowd from Boring today. Uh, I went to school at Duke University. I studied public policy and economics. I took some computer engineering classes on the side. I think I'm still widely known in North Carolina for my game Cannibal Carnage. Uh, and then after school, I moved to South America, to Buenos Aires, and I started working in business consulting, uh, then started working in IT and gradually got into a startup. Uh, I really, really enjoyed working at a startup, uh, learning, getting closer to engineering again, uh, the fast pace of the, the job. And then when I was ready to move back to the United States, I was looking for opportunities between public policy and you know, technology. And one of the only companies I could find was Palantir. So I joined them about seven years ago. Uh, I was in D.C. at the time. Since then, I've lived in uh, and worked for them in California, New York, Paris, and now London for the last several years. Uh, over the course of my career there, I've done a lot of different things, uh, including you know being parts of different teams, leading large teams, doing product development, and now uh, specifically focused on leading our work in financial services here in the U.K. and globally, really. Fantastic. Yeah. And so... Palantir was founded in 2004, um, became famous for various things, including the association with the, the capturing of uh, Osama bin Laden, um, but has, as far as I understand, moved from a, that initial focus on kind of government and security to a much broader range of things. Like, give us a bit of a sense of that journey for Palantir and where's, where's Palantir at now? Yeah, so while we were founded in 2004, uh, I don't think we really started to actually do any valuable work for the first four years. <laughs> Mainly we were building the wrong thing. Uh, so we kind of went into the intelligence space thinking that we were going to build something you might see in a Jason Bourne movie. So, you know, like really flashy visualization, you know, find the terrorist button. Uh, but when we got into the agencies, what we found is that they had this really uh, unsexy problem of data integration. They had data scattered all over these agencies, it was in many different formats, it was very difficult to integrate it all into one place, secure it, and then make it useful for non-technical human beings. Uh, so we built this platform to do that, and uh, you know we've worked in government for a long time, and then I would say the last five years, we've gotten really big in the private sector. Uh, so we were across you know, most major verticals, I would say uh, heavy, heavy industrials, manufacturing is kind of the biggest relationships we have. We have a ton of work in financial services, we do a lot in healthcare, CPG, media, um, across many different things. I think maybe more interesting for this audience is our growth in Europe. So our, you know, our found, we, we were founded in Silicon Valley in Palo Alto, uh, but now I think our London office is actually our largest office. Uh, we've just seen massive growth in Europe in the last several years, and it continues to be kind of our largest source of growth, which is you know, how an American ended up here. <laughs> I'm working on my accent. Chris is giving me lessons. <laughs> Um, and so it's great this point about we'd learned that we were building the wrong thing. Like um, I think a lot of startups go through these uh, phases of building, revising, building again. What's your sense? How did how did you know that you were building the wrong thing? How did how do you know now when you are building the right thing? Like what what are the what are the signals? Um, yeah, I mean I think we are really good at Palantir at admitting defeat and then trying the next thing. Uh, I think the other thing that we do a lot of are short, uh, since you know that initial period, are short, cheap experiments to test out if something's going to be valuable. So for, I mean, this, that sounds like very blasé uh, advice, but for an example, uh, you know, for one client, we were building out fraud alerts. And so instead of building out the entire machine learning, machine learning model, you know, integrating all the data, building out the model, doing the testing, we basically just mocked up what the alerts were going to say and put them in front of the fraud users or the fraud analysts and said, are these useful? And we got a lot of feedback really quickly of what was useful and what wasn't useful. And so then we actually built that into the model itself. Uh, instead of wasting time kind of learning that after we built the whole thing. So I think we've learned that and kind of baked that into our DNA that we should be doing these short, cheap experiments rather than doing kind of the end-to-end -end thing and then hoping for the best. Fantastic. And you mentioned um, a second ago that you're working with quite a wide range of types of clients now, so across government, um, across financial services, across other kinds of um, industries. We've just heard from... Uh, Vodafone and about their their partnership with um, Accenture, um, and some of the some of the challenges and opportunities there. Um, 
What's your sense of the, the state of play in those big, complex uh, organizations? Are they still really at the stage of trying to figure out what on earth to do with their data? Are they experimenting with more sophisticated stuff? Are there any kind of generalization, generalizations that you can draw from that, I guess, broad overview of the landscape that you see? Yeah, I think five years ago, the, the major thing that we saw was that no one really thought that using data was that valuable. Uh, so in that sense today, everyone knows it's valuable. I think they're all at very different stages of their data journey. Uh, but at least when we go into a lot of our customers, the conversation is no longer around, okay, let us tell you why data is valuable and more around, okay, how are we gonna get you to that pinnacle of being able to use AI to run your business? I think there's, you know, the conversation now is a lot around there's so much complexity to get from, you know, integrating data to, you know, using AI to run your business and helping customers along the way on that journey. Um, I mean, I would actually be very interested in your take on this too. You probably saw a lot of this at Quantum Black, so I'd be curious your sense. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, I think what we saw was a massive uh, spread, I guess. So um, even within the same industries, if we just take financial services, we would speak to some banks who would really just be focused on, we can't understand what is happening in our business today. Um, and we're very complex. We have these legacy systems that were maybe built in cobalt in like the 1960s and 70s. Um, all of the engineers who can update them are dying um, or else we have to pay them $100,000 a day because there's no one else who can fix these things. Um, and so there's the, this burden of kind of technology debt um, and others who were really experimenting with extremely uh, cutting edge uh, stuff. And um, one of the banks we were talking to was trying to change uh, the GAFA acronym to add their own name into it because they, wow, they, felt, <laughs> they felt that they were so uh, confident about their own um, abilities. So I think there was that, um, that, huge, um, that huge spread. But I think that there were themes running through that around trying to get their head around trust. You know, how, why should people trust us to, um, to hold this data, to use this data in this way? Um, and I guess around innovation, around kind of to your point about learning fast, failing fast, moving on fast, how, how they could build some of that culture into what are often large uh, legacy organizations. Um, the, I think there's an interesting question about how do governments do this and how do kind of corporate enterprises do this? Like, do you guys, you have different, similar or different tech stacks across government and corporates? Or like, how do you kind of see that difference between those two types of players? Yeah, we, we have two different platforms. One is aimed towards private sector, one is aimed towards public sector, but then they both kind of swap them uh, depending on the problem set that, that the customer has. I would say that it's actually surprising sometimes to see who's kind of farther along. Like for example, there's government clients who operate in very sensitive environments who are much farther along in adapting new technologies like the cloud than even some Fortune 500 companies like we worked with a large French bank. They wouldn't even entertain a conversation about using the cloud. And I think you know everyone knows at this point that it's more secure. So I think we're actually often surprised by you know who's farther along than who. Uh, I would say that the one commonality across everyone is that everyone thinks that they're the worst. They all think like, you know, we have the dirtiest data, we have the hardest systems to integrate, like you'll never be able to do this. And I think like the one thing I would say is that no one's ever like that bad. Uh, it's interesting, we, we found the same thing and we also found the flip side of that, which is that the grass was always greener somewhere else. So, so Quantum Black originally came out of um, Formula One and people would say, well, that's all right in Formula One because you've got control over X and Y and Z. Or if we're talking to a bank, they would say, well, it's all right in pharma because in pharma you can do X and Y and Z, but we're a bank. And then you go and talk to a pharma company and they say, well, it's all right in banking, but you know, we're a pharma company and so it's like really difficult for us. So there's that sense of, um, there's always the excuse that sort of, it's, it's both a sense of foreboding, but also a sense of, well, it's more difficult for us than it is for, for anyone else. I don't know if you yeah, find that. Totally. Yeah, totally. And it's kind of like, you know, if you've worked for the US government, like, trust me, everyone else is like much easier. So I don't know, <laughs> it's kind of hard to convince your customers of that, but I think, you know, people often get too, you know, nervous about moving ahead. So do you have super hyper duper uh, security clearance? Can you sort of walk into the Pentagon and they like high five you? And yeah, totally. Like? I'm going there this afternoon. <laughs> Just kidding. I only work on the private sector work, so I'm actually not cleared. And so I don't know a lot of kind of the, you know, more sensitive work. Uh, and anyone who would work on that has to have, you know, uh, the clearances necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we've heard a lot of sort of war stories on the, on the lab to live stage um, today. And... Um, it feels like for leaders of enterprises, there's a lot of um, complexity that they're trying to get their head around, right? There's this sort of stuff around infrastructure, there's this stuff around services, there's how do I build AI applications on top of all of this? 
Um, how do I tap into the right kind of domain expertise? Um, if, if, you're, if I'm a, the CEO of an organization, if I'm the leader of an organization, like, any thoughts on who do I call, what do I do? Because it seems like there are different players uh, who are trying to, who, who do these different things. Like, what's your experience of how organizations can be effective customers for all of these kinds of services? Um, for all the CEOs out there struggling with this, you can call me. Uh, I'll be available <laughs> after the talk to you. Um, I'm just kidding. But um, I think you have to have an ecosystem of players at this point. What you're trying to do is so complex that, you know, just choosing one technology obviously isn't going to work. I do think that there's kind of um, information overload. I think the people that we see really struggle are the people who are trying to stitch together, you know, 50 different technologies to try to make the perfect, you know, transformation tool. Uh, I would, I would strongly advise to invest in, you know, two to three major pieces of technologies, the best in class one, and get those running before you make it any more complex. I think people fundamentally, uh, you know lack uh, like a comprehension of how complex this stuff is going to be and as many things that you add to it the more fragile it's going to be and the more you're going to spend downstream when one of these things break and then 49 other pieces of te techno technology break. Uh, I, we know because we tried it and it's really really hard. Uh, you know we have hundreds of engineers who spend all day thinking about how to integrate data and you know it takes them forever to figure this out and so I just when I see customers trying to stitch you know all these things together I just I get worried about it. Um, I think, you know, the other thing is, I've, I guess I've heard this a lot, uh, so I apologize if it's become kind of trite, is like the buy versus build uh, mm -hmm. lesson. I think a good rule of thumb, and we do this at Palantir, is, you know, if, unless you have specific uh, expertise in something, it doesn't usually make sense to uh, build it yourself. So, for example, you know, I work with a lot of different banks. You know, I would recommend that they build the algorithms for their marketing strategies or build, you know, the, the specific configurations of their front end visualizations for their customers because they have specific expertise in, you know, their business strategy on how to reach those customers and be, or be successful with them. On the other hand, whether something, you know, general, uh, like, you know, a data platform or a cloud solution, I would not recommend building it because it's really, really hard. Uh, and it took us, you know, 15 years. Um, so those are the things I would say. And then, the, oh, sorry, one more thing, and then, yeah, uh, is tackle the low-hanging fruit. Uh, I think, you know, a lot of times we'll go into a meeting and someone will say, oh, can you build me, you know, this consortium of every single player in the healthcare industry to magically predict, you know, who's going to get this disease. And then you look at what they actually have, and they have a data lake, which no one in the business uses. They have a massive cloud account and no data in it. And you just wonder why they're not tackling these problems first. Like, why don't they have a, you know, a task force focused on getting, you know, their entire enterprise into the cloud, which is much cheaper and more secure. And they're thinking, you know, about these plans that are going to take, you know, decades to materialize. So I think the other thing is, like, true transformation comes from fixing these low-hanging fruits and, you know, doing that very fast and learning from it, not from kind of, you know, taking these moonshots that, you know, you're just not prepared to tackle until you take some of that dirty work. Mm. I don't know if you have thoughts on that too, since you've yeah, seen it a no, lot. Yeah, no, I do. Um, the I was on a panel recently with um, the CEO of a, a big Chinese, I guess, like scale-up um, company that does a lot of things like the facial recognition and sort of gait analysis. The, these technologies that are now being hyperscaled across uh, many parts of China. And one of the um, audience members was the the CEO of a telco company, and he said, "Well, look, we're really trying to build our own capabilities to." build this kind of technology in-house to your sort of make versus buy thing. What would your advice be about how we could do that? And it was really refreshing. The, the Chinese CEO, who I'm deliberately not naming because it's not fair, but um, just started giggling. He was like, ha, why on earth would you try and do that? Like, why would you try and build this stuff in-house? You know, I have 500 machine learning PhDs working for me. You know, you have none. Like, what are you doing? Um, and it, it is quite an interesting one because in lots of um, these kinds of discussions in Europe, a lot of it is about capability building. A lot of it is, you know, how can we build our own team to do this? So I think actually challenging ourselves on what are the sensible boundaries for make versus buy and particularly for the more complex cutting edge parts of uh, AI is a really, uh, a really valid question. Um, I think you do have to buy, you want to make sure you invest in technologies that are open and that you retain control over and that, you know, you don't have to, you know, invest in consulting services to tweak or adjust in the future. Uh, that's been a big learning for us. And so, you know, I think five years ago, it would have been hard for Quantum Black to use our platform. And now they use it kind of all over mm. the world because, again, it shouldn't be proprietary to have to Palantir. It should be, you know, your system once you buy it. You know, it's all of your tools. 
Absolutely. So I just want to change uh, gears a bit. You told us that you studied economics and public policy, right? Right. Um, and and I made Kimball Carnage. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so hold on. Let's let's talk about this. <laughs> what's what's the Kimball Kimball Carnage? Kimball Carnage? Or no, it was called Kimball Cannibal Crunch? Carnage. It was the first video game that I made. Ah. Yeah, it's wildly popular. <laughs> Is it, was this a level levels game, or can we get it on Super NES? <laughs> yeah, I'll talk to you about that after. Okay. <laughs> so. There are some parts of technology that are very happy making, um, like Kimball Carnage, like other uh, sort of platform games. In fact, my uh, my ten-year-old twins um, just went on a code camp for a weekend, and they can, uh, ten-year-old twins can now build uh, level games on uh, on computers, which is great. Not to undermine your achievement, there, but, um, which is great. But there are <laughs> beyond uh, beyond platform games. Um, there are. Um, concerns around the, the role of big tech um, in society. Um, you know, people talk about tech lash, um, the world is moving so fast, uh, privacy, all of these big topics. Um, Palantir, um, Google, Facebook, um, Alibaba, Baidu, like all of these uh, large companies that are at least processing large amounts of um, data. What's your sense of what the responsibilities are for the large tech players and um, how can we best have a dialogue where we make it easy or you know both easy and necessary for those obligations to be fulfilled like how can we best kind of bring this bring tech and society closer together i guess yeah i mean i think it's a little bit hard because all those companies do vastly different things yeah. i think you know palantir for example doesn't collect or store or you know own any data itself it's just a software tool that other people use um, but at the same time i do think there's several different aspects here. I think mm. one is that technology companies need to understand that anything they build is going to have, you know, sociological, ethical, uh, cultural consequences. And if they don't, they're going to fail. And at worst, they're going to, you know, hurt somebody or harm people. I think Facebook's an interesting example there because, you know, they built this awesome platform for sharing photos and for making friends. And then all of a sudden it's used by half of the electorate for their primary media consumption. And you can see what happens in, you know, various elections because of that. Um, I do think uh, tech has to do a better job communicating about itself and explaining and educating people on what it, what we do. Uh, you know, Palantir is a great example of that. Uh, I think there's some term, I forget who actually coined it, uh, called like technical solutionism. And it's kind of Silicon Valley's tendency to s explain that everything can be solved by technology, that every single problem, even ones you haven't even considered, can be solved by technology. And I think, uh, you know, we have to do a better, more accurate and more sober job of explaining what technology does and what it's capable of, because I think that sort of, you know, insanity, quite frankly, is actually it's like sowing distrust and discord between the public and tech companies. Uh, and finally, hopefully governance will improve as well. I think governance efforts to, to date have probably been pretty, pretty you know, suboptimal, depending on your viewpoint. Uh, I think private companies aren't doing an adequate job regulating themselves. Um, at the same time, I think public efforts have been, you know, there's various efforts around and some of them are good, some of them are less good, but I think they're often hampered by the lack of technical expertise of regulators and enforcement agencies. And so a lot of these, you know, governance processes just lack teeth. Um, and then there's like newer, you know, newer forms of governance, which I think are pretty interesting. One very common one uh, is, you know, the tech workers themselves who are starting to actually mm -hmm. have uh, a lot to say about how the technologies and services that they're creating are being used by their employers. And so I think, you know, hopefully this will have a balancing effect on both the public serve or the public side governance and the, the private companies themselves. But again, if they're, you know, uh, misinformed or uneducated, it can be destructive as well. So. Th those are kind of yeah. several thoughts on that topic. No, for sure. And you, men you mentioned this point about the, the power of talent, right? And we've had walkouts or protests and you know, lots of people signing letters and so on about the decisions that their company's leadership are making or not making. Um, talent is obviously such a big, uh, I guess, bottleneck or constraint for uh, large tech companies. How are you thinking about it at Palantir, about um, bringing in more diverse profiles, continuing to get access to the talent that you need? Um, you know, I've noticed, I'm, th I'm that perceptive that I've noticed as well as having an American accent, you're a woman. <laughs> I'm that <Thank> sharp. <laughs> um, how are you thinking about getting more, uh, more women into these roles and, and other di diverse profiles? Yeah, I mean, we're always looking for uh, more strong technical talent. So, you know, if your 10-year-old twins are curious <laughs> for an internship, let me know. They're ready. Yeah, great. 
Um, and I mean, there's a lot of different ways. I think maybe I'll start on the diversity question, which mm. is obviously very uh, important to me. Uh, I think we've done a lot of different things. We've experimented a lot with this. Uh, I think you know we participate in industry events that you know attract women and minority candidates like Grace Hopper. Uh, we've done a lot of work to make sure that to try to limit bias from our process. So we've taken names off resumes and seen that actually has a pretty big effect on you know how people treat the interviewee. Uh, we do, you know, bias training. We also have someone whose explicit role in each kind of candidate roundtable when we assess candidates is to basically watch out for bias. So I was in one recently and someone comment, made the comment, oh, you know, that woman, she was really good, but she just really lacked confidence. And, you know, we kind of asked, like, well, why do you think she lacked confidence? And, like, what made you think that? And, like, how is that actually going to impact her in her engineering role? And kind of got to the bottom of that. So there's things like that that we do to try to protect minority can candidates. Uh, another interesting one is actually moving away from kind of like the brain teasers that you hear about uh, and having some more open-ended questions on a lot of our interviews. Uh, because that gives candidates a chance to tell their story. And so there's a lot of stories that involve kind of overcoming hardship, which I think, you know, often is one of the stronger reasons you, you know, you can hire some of these people. Uh, like myself, I would say. Um, and so there's, those are different things that we've experimented with. I think in terms of looking for the best technical talent, uh, you have to treat them well. So I think, you know, we give them or we, we recommend you give them like the best technical tools. Uh, so I'm always kind of, I laugh a little bit when I go to some, you know, some large companies who spend, you know, thousands of dollars trying to hire and find the best data scientists. And then you see that they're using Internet Explorer on the company's computer and you're just like, <laughs> Like, best of luck, man. Um, <laughs> you, we also encourage, you know, open source, uh, you know, contributions to open source. You know, if you hire the best engineers, they're going to want to be, mm -hmm. you know, stay on the bleeding edge of technology and they're going to want to participate in that community. So we encourage that as well. Uh, and then things like, you know, mission is really important. So, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. I think for us, Palantir, ours is really around saving the world. That's what we were founded around. And I think if you talk to anyone at Palantir, they're pretty obsessive about it. Uh, and I think, you know, if you could, they can, you know, go get a job at any company in the valley. They can have free snacks. They can, you know, get a massage at lunchtime. Uh, it's quite someone. It's quite someone else who's going to be an excellent engineer and then want to go work in, you know, a skiff underground or get deployed to Afghanistan, not see their family for months. Uh, and so they have to have a pretty good reason to do that. And for most people, it's not just money. It's really about, you know, what is my contribution going to lead to? Fantastic. Um, so we're close up on time. I think. I think I'm right in saying you mentioned that um, on this diversity point, A, that Palantir is a very strong sort of meritocracy, and B, that the women are now better paid than the men on average in their roles. Is that true? Like, how does that, how does that play out? Yeah. Um, I think, I just noticed your shirt said human being, too. I am a human being, yeah. Both men, both men and women are human beings. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry for these men. Um, yeah, I think we did a study in the UK specifically last year, because I think we have to publicly report uh, our diversity figures, and we found that for... Uh, like for like positions, uh, women tended to be higher paying slightly. It was like three percent. It's not you know massive, um, in you know most engineering and leadership positions. And then yeah, I think you know we're far below. We don't have enough women. I, I'm not going to say we're like some oasis of you know gender and you know minority equality at Palantir. Uh, I think we always need to be doing better and finding these people. Um, but I would say that you know we have two thirds of our product org is led by women. Uh, there's a lot of women driving the business forward uh, in the field uh, with our forward deployed engineering work. Uh, and so for us, I'm actually, that's one of the reasons that makes me feel, you know, happy about the company and our efforts in this area, because I do see strong indicators that it matters to us. And so what are you doing to um, protect and promote all of those poor, underprivileged white male engineers? Oh. No, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> so um, maybe uh, final question. I've sort of jokingly touched on uh, my kids. Like... If people want to be uh, applicants to Palantir, which is you know very difficult to get into, um, there's this thing about should all of our kids be coding, um, or actually is coding going to be obsolete? Like, what are your thoughts on if uh, people uh, either in the audience or watching online have have kids? What should our kids be studying these days? You know, million dollar question. Yeah, I mean. I think you should be going after what you're good at and what you enjoy. Uh, you know, I think it's great that you know most people have technical skills at this point. I also think it's really important to retain skills in the arts as well because you know some of the best engineers I know are leading really big teams, and a lot of them have some arts background so that they can communicate their ideas and really project like why what they're doing is important. So I think it's really compelling to have a mix of technical skills and you know the arts, whether it be you know writing, philosophy, anything like that. 
I think, you know, we chatted a bit earlier, our, we have leadership at both of our companies who have philosophy backgrounds. Our CEO, Alex Karp, has a PhD in philosophy. And honestly, I think it's one of the best things for our company. Uh, I think because technology exists in such a complex area, if you're working across, and especially at Palantir, you know, we're working on issues such as state security, uh, citizens' privacy, uh, defense, uh, it's, these are really complex topics, and if you don't have someone who can really navigate and think these through deeply, I'd be very concerned about where the company's mm -hmm. going. Um, I think those are the main things I would study. That's great. Well, as someone who was laughed out of town uh, a long time ago for doing joint honors in uh, medieval history and computer science, um, yeah. all I can say is the, the check's in the post. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, great job, so Chris. <laughs> You're a great human being. Oh, who knew? Um, so um, I think that's all we have time for, but please uh, join me in thanking Marissa for coming and uh, talking with us today. <laughs>